Good morning, and welcome to Teddy Talks for Monday, May 18th, 2020. I'm your host, Joe Wiegan, coming to you from Medora, North Dakota, gateway to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, the beautiful badlands of North Dakota, and uh, home of the Medora musical, and looking forward to joining you this summer here in Medora. We have a wonderful week of programs ahead during this 26 days with the 26th president during the month of May. Uh, today's program, a reading from uh, The Wilderness Hunter, the second of Theodore Roosevelt's books that he wrote primarily while ranching and hunting in this region. Uh, the uh, Wilderness Hunter on the Cattle Range. We'll read the first half of that chapter today. Tomorrow, Tuesday, May 19th, an address at the Capitol Building in Sacramento, California. Uh, this in the midst of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's 1903 tour of the Western states and that region west of the West, as we've heard him say, California. Wednesday, May 20th, The Two Americas, the speech at the formal opening of the Pan American Exposition uh, on May 20th, 1901, by then Vice President Theodore Roosevelt. This is, of course, the same Pan American Expo that would be ongoing on September 6th, 1901, where uh, President McKinley would be shot. Uh, he would uh, die on the uh, morning, early morning hours of September 14th, 1901. We'll uh, hear from Vice President Theodore Roosevelt about the two Americas. The Pan American Expo, of course, having the representatives of uh, a number of South American and Latin American, Central American countries uh, uh, during that, uh, that expo. Thursday, May 21st, a couple of uh, speeches at the dedications uh, on two different sides of the country. We go to May 21st, 1902, the unveiling of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument under the auspices of the National Society of Colonial Dames of America, Arlington National Cemetery, Arlington, Virginia. And the following May 21st, 1903, our Western trip with Theodore Roosevelt takes us to Portland, Oregon, and remarks at the dedication of the Lewis and Clark Memorial. It's a beautiful spot uh, up in the hills on the uh, west side of Portland. Friday, May 22nd, remarks in Tacoma and Olympia, Washington, May 22nd, 1903, and we're going to uh, um, uh, go to both uh, 1902 and 1903 for the concluding program, Saturday, May 23rd, speaking uh, uh, in 1902, both at sea on board a French Navy ship and then the following day in Washington, D.C. So those remarks from both the 23rd and 24th of May, 1902, Speaking of Rochambeau, uh, the great uh, French admiral and the French Navy uh, in those 1902 remarks. And in 1903, remarks to the Arctic Brotherhood and separately at an Alaska reception. Both of those in Seattle, Washington, May 23rd, 1903. Theodore Roosevelt never made it to Alaska. Uh, he had thought after his presidency that he would go uh, to Alaska, but uh, he was convinced instead to go on his famous trip to, uh, to Africa. And, uh, but this is a wonderful opportunity on Saturday then to hear some of Theodore Roosevelt's thoughts and themes with regards to Alaska. On this date in history, May 18th, 1631, in Dorchester, Massachusetts, John Winthrop takes the oath of office and becomes the first governor of Massachusetts. In uh, May 18th, 1822, the birth of Matthew Brady, American photographer and journalist. Uh, he would die in 1896. We know the Civil War visually in great part for the uh, photographs of Matthew Brady and, and then uh, that being such the substance of Ken Burns' Civil War. In May 1855, the birth of Francis Bellamy, an American minister and author. May 18th, 1860, Abraham Lincoln wins the Republican Party presidential nomination over William H. Seward, who later becomes Secretary of State. If you were with us, we uh, celebrated Seward's birthday just the other day. What a, uh, what a spoiler of a birthday party. I remember uh, he wasn't in Chicago, of course. He was uh, in uh, Auburn, New York. And Doris Kearns Goodwin tells the story amazingly in Team of Rivals, uh, so titled because, the, uh, because Abraham Lincoln took all of these rivals that he had politically and made them a part of his cabinet and a part of his team. They were waiting to fire the cannons in celebration when the news came from Chicago that Seward was the 1860 Republican nominee. 
It wasn't to be. The, the uh, cannons went unfired. May 18th, 1862, the birth on this date of Josephus Daniels, American publisher and politician. We remember him as the 41st United Secretary of the Navy. The uh, story I enjoy is the origin of the cup of joe. Uh, that's coffee and uh, how we like our coffee, especially on a, a Monday morning. Good to the last drop, right? And uh, Josephus Daniels was a teetotaler in the rise of the Prohibition movement and practiced what he preached. He gave an order that uh, in the United States Navy there should no longer be any liquor, no spirits kept on board, and woe to the captain who was found with a bottle of whiskey in his desk. So uh, uh, the uh, officers on board the ship, uh, when they wanted to go have a drink that was the strongest drink to be found on one of uh, 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 Josephus Daniels' ships, they would say, uh, let's go have a cup of joe. That's uh, the story I've heard. Uh, the birth, uh, uh, well, let's first go back to uh, May 18th, 1896, the United States Supreme Court rules in Plessy versus Ferguson that the separate but equal doctrine is constitutional. A reminder that even the United States Supreme Court needs correction uh, on occasion. Uh, May 18th, 1868, the birth of Nicholas II of Russia. Uh, he would go on to be the, uh, the czar of the Russian Empire and, and be the uh, person represented in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, to end the Russo-Japanese War under the Treaty of Portsmouth. May 18th, 1897, this perhaps even a bit of personal prerogative, the birth and Bussequino, Sicily, Italy, of Frank Capra, the Italian-American director, producer, and screenwriter. Uh, I can't imagine my life without It's a Wonderful Life, but as a person that uh, loves our republic, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. If you're still looking for something new and different to watch and you haven't watched Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, that wonderful work of Frank Capra, Please do so. Uh, I was uh, loaned a book by my good friend uh, John, uh, 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 Paul Hay up in the Adirondacks, and it was a book about all of these directors and producers that went to war in World War II, and Frank Capra amongst them. Speeches by Theodore Roosevelt on this day in 1903 in California, just really whistle-stop co uh, comments. Uh, quickly then, uh, the birth, May 18, 1904, of Jacob Javits, American colonel and politician, 58th New York Attorney General, and namesake for the uh, Javits Center in New York City. May 18th, 1917, World War I, the Selective Service Act of 1917 is passed, and we begin drafting uh, into the uh, United States Armed Forces. On this date, May 18th, 1918, uh, the opening of a service club for men at the Moose Hall in Coney Island, New York. Theodore Roosevelt made uh, comments there. They were uh, briefly reported in the newspaper, but I've thought today, Monday morning, many people uh, headed to work, either online or increasingly in person. We hear that uh, industries are opening up uh, in certain places, that people are figuring out how to uh, go to uh, uh, their employment, their office, their uh, production line, and do so at a safe distance and under safe conditions. Uh, under conditions uh, as best as can be, I, I correct myself. Uh, life isn't safe. Theodore Roosevelt said, and these words I saw uh, stenciled in, uh, uh, carved in to the memorial for Quentin Roosevelt in uh, Collange Cohan, only those are fit to live who are not afraid to die. Uh, the um, author McCullough, I believe, on a documentary, I saw him say, well, that's just the thing. The rest of us are afraid to die. Theodore Roosevelt, um, maybe other figures in your readings of history come to mind. Those who seem to go undaunted into the challenges of life, leaving, uh, believing and knowing that life has its, uh, its risks and that at any moment uh, that uh, calamity uh, and, and death might uh, come upon us. Theodore Roosevelt, in his book uh, Wilderness Hunter, published in 1889, tells us of these, some of these stories. Uh, uh, he fell off a cliff and fell uh, 50 feet uh, uh, into and through a, a big fir tree, a, a fall that could have killed a man. And, and uh, as any person who's uh, ridden horses fast across the, the prairie or hunted in the mountains, uh, there's always just a, one little slip away from uh, some devastation. So I look out onto a uh, medora that's coming to life. I myself have been called to attend a video conference uh, shortly uh, 7.30 local time. So hence the choosing of a reading that might be uh, a bit briefer than others that we've done, and, and at the same time a meeting during which you'll hear uh, young Theodore Roosevelt writing about a recollection of uh, 
uh, the uh, the office meeting and the uh, distribution of duties out on the uh, out on the plains and prairies here uh, in the Badlands, uh, out in the area to the west, which has uh, been on our mind as well, our neighbors in eastern Montana, uh, many of whom come to uh, Medora to enjoy our summer. Uh, some of our finest uh, young people working with us here from the ranches of eastern Montana. Uh, so this is uh, on the cattle ranges. Uh, when I conclude, I will be sparing you the subsequent story of uh, the pronghorn antelope. Uh, the wilderness hunter is organized by uh, the species uh, that Theodore Roosevelt was uh, stalking in the wilderness and in different hunts in the Rocky Mountains and elsewhere through the regions of the great uh, upper Midwest and elsewhere. I think there's a story down here of uh, hunting the javelina down along the Nueces River in Texas, but most of the stories are up in this region. And so uh, you'll hear why Theodore Roosevelt was out uh, hunting after the pronghorn antelope, which you'll see here when we often list the wildlife uh, to be seen here, the uh, bison, uh, buffalo to some of you, the, uh, uh, the uh, feral horses or the wild horses here, uh, the bighorn sheep. Uh, often we forget about uh, uh, the occasional elk and the prolific uh, pronghorn antelope. Uh, beautiful to see them bounding uh, through the fields nearby or just lazing themselves. Well, on the cattle ranges. Early one June, just after the close of the regular spring roundup, a couple of wagons with a score of riders between them were sent to work some hitherto untouched country between the Little Missouri and the Yellowstone. I was to go as the representative of our own and of one or two neighboring brands, but as the roundup had halted near my ranch, I determined to spend a day there and then to join the wagons, the appointed meeting place being a cluster of red scoria buttes some forty miles distant where there was a spring of good water. Most of my day at the ranch was spent in slumber, for I had been several weeks on the roundup where nobody ever gets quite enough sleep. This is the only drawback to the work. Otherwise, it is pleasant and exciting, with just that slight touch of danger necessary to give it zest, and without the wearing fatigue of such labor as lumbering or mining. But there is never enough sleep, at least on the spring and midsummer roundups. The men are in the saddle from dawn until dusk, at the time when the days are longest on these great northern plains, and in addition there is the regular night guarding, and now and then a furious storm or a stampede, when for twenty-four hours at a stretch the riders only dismount to change horses or snatch a mouthful of food. I started in the bright sunrise, riding one horse and driving loose before me eight others, one carrying my bedding. They traveled, strung out in single file. I kept them trotting and loping, for loose horses are easiest to handle when driven at some speed, and moreover the way was long. My rifle was slung under my thigh, the lariat was looped on the saddle horn. At first our trail led through winding coolies and sharp grassy defiles. The air was wonderfully clear, the flowers were in bloom, the breath of the wind in my face was odorous and sweet. The patter and beat of the unshod hooves rising in half-rhythmic measure, frightened the scudding deer, but the yellow-breasted meadowlarks perched on the budding tops of the bushes sang their rich, full songs without heeding us as we went by. When the sun was well on high and the heat of the day had begun, we came to a dreary and barren plain, broken by rows of low clay buttes. The ground in places was whitened by alkali, elsewhere it was dull gray, here there grew nothing save sparse tufts of coarse grass and cactus and sprawling sagebrush. In the hot air all things seen afar danced and wavered. As I rode and gazed at the shimmering haze, the vast desolation of the landscape bore on me. It seemed as if the unseen and unknown powers of the wastes were moving by and marshalling their silent forces. No man save the wilderness dweller knows the strong, melancholy fascination of these long rides through lonely lands. At noon, uh, that the horses might graze and drink, I halted where some box alders grew by a pool in the bed of a half-dry creek, and shifted my saddle to a fresh beast. 
When we started again, we came out on the rolling prairie, where the green sea of wind-rippled grass stretched limitless as far as the eye could reach. Little striped gophers scuttled away, or stood perfectly straight at the mouths of their burrows, looking like picket pins. Curlews clamored mournfully as they circled overhead. Prairie fowl swept off, clucking and calling, or strutted about with their sharp tails erect. Antelope were plentiful, running like racehorses across the level, or uttering their queer, barking grunt as they stood at gaze, uh, the white hairs on their rumps all on end, their neck bands of broken brown and white vivid in the sunlight. They were found singly or in small straggling parties. The master bucks had not yet begun to drive out the younger and weaker ones, as later in the season, when each would gather into a herd as many does as his jealous strength could guard from rivals, the nursing does whose kids had come early were often found with the bands the others kept apart. The kids were very conspicuous figures on the prairies, across, across which they scudded like jackrabbits, showing nearly as much speed and alertness as their parents. Only the very young sought safety by lying flat to escape notice. The horses cantered and trotted steadily over the mat of buffalo grass, steering for the group of low scoria mounds which was my goal. In mid-afternoon I reached it. The two wagons were drawn up near the spring. Under them lay the night wranglers, asleep. Nearby the teamster cooks were busy about the evening meal. A little way off the two-day wranglers were watching the horse herd, into which I speedily turned my own animals. The riders had already driven in the bunches of cattle, and were engaged in branding the calves, and turning loose the animals that were not needed, while the remainder were kept forming the nucleus of the herd which was to accompany the wagon. As soon as the work was over, the men rode to the wagons, sinewy fellows, with tattered broad-brimmed hats and clanking spurs, some wearing leather shaps or leggings, other having their trousers tucked into their high-heeled top boots, all with their flannel shirts and loose neckerchiefs, dusty and sweaty. A few were indulging in rough, good-natured horseplay, uh, to an accompaniment of yelling mirth. Most were grave and taciturn, greeting me with a silent nod or a, How, friend? A very talkative man, unless the acknowledged wit of the party, according to the somewhat florid frontier notion of wit, is always looked on with disfavor in a cow camp. After supper, eaten in silent haste, we gathered round the embers of the small fires, and the conversation glanced fitfully over the threadbare subjects common to all such camps. The antics of some particularly vicious bucking bronco, how the different brands of cattle were showing up, the smallness of the calf drop, the respective merits of rawhide lariats and grass ropes, and bits of rather startling and violent news concerning the fates of certain neighbors. Then, one by one, we began to turn in under our blankets. Our wagon was to furnish the night guards for the cattle, and each of us had his gentlest horse tied ready to hand. The night guards went on duty two at a time for two hour watches. By good luck, my watch came last. My comrade was a happy-go-lucky young Texan who, for some inscrutable reason, was known as Latigo Strap. He had just come from the south with a big drove of trail cattle. A few minutes before, too, one of the guards, who had gone on duty at midnight, rode into camp and wakened us by shaking our shoulders. Fumbling in the dark, I speedily saddled my horse. Latigo had left his saddle, and he started ahead of me. One of the annoyances of night guarding, at least in thick weather, is the occasional difficulty in finding the herd after leaving camp, or in returning to camp after the watch is over. There are few things more exasperating than to be helplessly wandering about in the dark under such circumstances. However, on this occasion there was no such trouble, for it was a brilliant starlit night, and the herd had been bedded down by a sugarloaf butte which made a good landmark. As we reached the spot, we could make out the loom of the cattle lying close together on the level plain, and then the dim figure of a horseman rose vaguely from the darkness and moved by in silence. It was the other of the two midnight guards on his way back to his broken slumber. At once we began to ride slowly round the cattle in opposite directions. We were silent, for the night was clear and the herd quiet. In wild weather, when the cattle are restless, the cowboys never cease calling and singing as they circle them, for the sound seemed to quiet the beasts. 
For over an hour we steadily pace the endless round, saying nothing with our greatcoats button, for the air is chill towards morning on the northern plains, even in summer. Then faint streaks of grey appeared in the east. Latigo's strap began to call merrily to the cattle. A coyote came sneaking over the butte nearby and halted to yell and wail. Afterwards he crossed the coulee and from the hillside opposite again shrieked in dismal crescendo. The dawn brightened rapidly. The little skylarks of the plains began to sing, soaring far overhead, while it was still much too dark to see them. Their song is not powerful, but it is so clear and fresh and long continued that it is always uh, that it always appeals to one very strongly, especially because it is most often heard in the rose-tinted air of the glorious mornings, while the listener sits in the saddle looking across the endless sweep of the prairies. As it grew lighter, the cattle became restless, rising and stretching themselves while we continued to ride round them. Then the bronc began to pit and I began to ride. He bucked me off a cut bank. Hell, I nearly died, sang Latigo from the other side of the herd. A yell from the wagons told that the, cooks were, the cook was summoning the sleeping cowpunchers to breakfast. We were soon able to distinguish their figures as they rolled out of their bedding, wrapped and corded it into bundles and huddled subtle, sullenly round the little fires. The horse wranglers were driving in the saddlebands, all the cattle got on their feet and started feeding. In a few minutes, the hasty breakfast at the wagons had evidently been dispatched, for we could see the men forming rope corrals into which the ponies were driven. Then each man saddled, bridled, and mounted his horse, two or three of the half-broken beasts bucking, rearing, and plunging frantically in the vain effort to unseat their riders. The two men who were first in the saddle relieved Latigo and myself, and we immediately galloped to camp, shifted our saddles to fresh animals, gulped down a cup or two of hot coffee and some pork beans and bread, and rode to the spot where the others were gathered, lolling loosely in their saddles and waiting for the roundup boss to assign them their tasks. We were the last, and as soon as we arrived, the boss divided all into two parties for the morning work or circle riding, whereby the cattle were to be gathered for the roundup proper. Then, as the others started, he turned to me and remarked, We've got enough hands to drive this open country without you, but we're out of meat, and I don't want to kill a beef for such a small outfit. Can you shoot some antelope this morning? We'll pitch camp by the big blasted cottonwoods at the foot of the ash coolies over yonder, below the breaks of Dry Creek. Of course, I gladly assented, and was speedily riding alone across the grassy slopes. That was the morning meeting that Theodore Roosevelt participated in. Uh, that was on the cattle ranges, uh, as told in The Wilderness Hunter. Uh, they're calling me to morning meetings this morning. So a briefer reading from Theodore Roosevelt today. As I mentioned, we've got a, a wonderful week of programs. And, and for me, I think uh, a highlight, uh, the Wednesday program, the speech at the opening of the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. But, all of the, uh, uh, the programs chosen this week for you, uh, especially to bring to life the words of Theodore Roosevelt, hopefully to give you some inspiration, some entertainment, uh, things we hope to do here when we live up to our calling in Medora to be a, 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 an institution, a, a group of people where we connect people to place for positive, life-changing experiences. I'm looking forward. I've been watching the gentleman from Michigan uh, who have been uh, completing our little bully uh, putt-putt golf course. And I'm glad that this summer we'll see the families, uh, the grandparents and parents and children, all gathered together for a little fun. And maybe we'll go hike the buttes and look down below upon this beautiful village of Medora. We're looking forward to seeing you the rest of the week here on Teddy Talks. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Goodbye, good luck, and we'll see you tomorrow here at Teddy Talks.